first started coming here, you know, I had to find all the different spots. So at first it was a lot harder, but now I know exactly where they're going to be. Yeah. Alright, so the idea is we have to clear around it so we won't lose it. So just I think it might have gone under the brick. There it is. Two! I think one might be under my hand, but I'm not sure. Oh, there it is. It, all, it was like going into your vial and then it ran away. And being squished to a reasonable degree. Yeah, with the females, it's impossible to tell unless you shine a light on their underside because the, the males for this population can look just like the females. So I'd say a female. She's probably got a, like a little egg. You can see that white spot developing. Yeah, you have to go super slow because they're so fast that if you try to make quick movements, they'll just shoot off and be gone. So you have to go real slow so that you don't spook them too much. I'm Steph Clements. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Biology at the University of Miami and a conservation biologist. The Florida reef gecko is really cool because they're actually the only native gecko species that we have east of the Mississippi in the United States. Um, they're a unique component of our South Florida fauna. They're only found in Miami, Dade, Broward, and Monroe counties. Um, they're part of the dwarf gecko family, so there are other dwarf geckos throughout the, Car throughout the Caribbean, but these are the only ones that we have here in the United States. While they're found at really high densities at the locations where they're found, uh, they seem to be declining across across their South Florida range. Their range in the U.S. is pretty small and anecdotally people have thought that they seem to be declining. So we wanted to assess what is their current distribution, is this species in decline, and what kinds of threats are they facing. Um, looking into a future with climate change, being here in Miami-Dade County where we're so close to sea level uh, and worrying about the risk to this species in the future. only found the geckos within 1.2 kilometers of the coast, so they seem to be a coastal specialist species. Pretty much wherever you find sea grapes of, that have significant cover, mm -hmm. that's usually an excellent space to find them. Uh, I know there's one island that we surveyed, Boca Chita, and Literally, the only place we found the geckos on the whole island was one sea grape tree. <laughs> one that sea grape. <laughs> this mix of like fresh leaves and old leaves, you know, they, they really like it when it's like in you know, layers. It's just hard to keep track of them with the sea grapes. When you find them, they're great. And they've got these cool eyes, like they can, kind of like chameleons, they can kind of move each eye independently. So they can actually like stare like at a bug that's right in front of their nose. It looks really funny, it looks like cross-eyed. When we compared to all of the other reptiles and amphibians in the United States, we found that the geckos are actually the 
uh, herp or reptile and amphibian most at risk of sea level rise based on their average elevation and their average distance to coast. Uh, so that makes us concerned for the future of this species in the face of climate change, increased storm surge, and increased sea level. Well, micro reserves is basically the idea of protecting a really small area of habitat that can actually be enough to help protect population uh, within a certain area. This particular species seems like a good candidate for a micro reserve approach because they are so small and they are so dense. And so even if we could protect like a small area of hardwood hammock, a population could likely keep persisting within that area without going locally extinct. Manga Bay.